Together, they commanded the skyline of Manhattan. Two gleaming towers symbolizing the engineering and economic power of New York City. But within just an hour and 42 minutes, they were gone. I couldn't understand what was happening. It just, it was impossible to relate to it. Sixteen acres of Lower Manhattan lay in ruins as the city and country mourned the nearly 3,000 lost. I can hear you. The rest of the world hears you. And the people who knocked these buildings down will hear all of us soon. In the wake of tragedy, an unknown future lay ahead. So after 9-11, there was a huge debate over what to do at ground zero. And everyone had an opinion. How could you build on sacred ground? The whole site should be a memorial. In the span of 20 years, the site was transformed from a crater to the city's newest landmark. It's like a lighthouse. It's a beacon. It sort of speaks to the strength of our city, its ambitions. And you just see the building glow, and you'd sort of be drawn to it and feel, in some way, proud. The decades-long journey to rebuild was full of contrasting proposals, clashing opinions, and continual setbacks. And in some ways, it's still not over. Little did I dream, here we are 22 years, and we still have two buildings to go. <laughs> If you are a New Yorker and we're here, this place could be off limits to a lot of people emotionally. I unfortunately lost my sister in 9-11. She was an equities trader uh, in Tower 2, in the South Tower. So I have a, I had a love-hate relationship with this area. After 9-11, I did not come down here a lot. Carrie Irvine is a painter. After she lost her sister, she lost the will to work. A friend convinced her to reach out to the developers of the World Trade Center site. Here at Building 3, artists can work rent-free, 80 stories in the air on unleased floors. I remember I got down here and I turned around and it, the pool was right across the street and she's smack in the middle of the wall facing both of these towers. I took it as a sign, sort of forgot where I was. For the last 15 years, artists of all kinds have used this space as a studio. They come and go as they please. Some let the gravity of where they are inform their work, intentional or not. She was my best friend and she was a beautiful person inside and out. I can touch her name in the morning, just say hi. It's been incredibly healing for me and life-changing. One of the most dramatic events in New York City in the 1960s was the construction of the World Trade Center. Design and construction would take years and the efforts of thousands of people. They were massive two icons in the sky, and a beacon to the world. The towers were built and owned by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. The architect behind the towers was famed Japanese-American Minoru Yamasaki, who won the job in 1962. This is an original model of the World Trade Center from the 1960s. It was just a phenomenally large building. The towers began their ascent in 1968. At the time of their completion, they were the tallest buildings in the world. Using state-of-the-art structural engineering, they soared 1,368 feet into the sky, surpassing the Empire State Building, which once held the title by 118 feet. Because it was built on a landfill, workers had to dig 70 feet down into bedrock to create a slurry wall to keep the Hudson River out. The water is always trying to get in. 
The Port Authority back in the 1960s created what was known as a bathtub. So they created slurry walls around the perimeter of the site to keep the water out. Then they built up the basements and the foundations of the Twin Towers, and then they built the buildings on top. The towers were only the tallest in the world for a few short years before the completion of the Sears Tower in Chicago. Still, they represented the pinnacle of modern engineering and quickly became an iconic part of the New York skyline. The towers became a central hub for the burgeoning global economy. When the Port Authority put up the World Trade Center for lease, New York real estate tycoon Larry Silverstein won the bid. He signed the lease on July 24th, 2001. We took title uh, to the Trade Center uh, six weeks before 9-11. 9-11 transpired, and it changed our lives totally. Investors occurring in New York City this morning, and if you are a New York State firefighter, drop what you're doing, report to your company. Now we find ourselves with this massive issue. Do we or don't we? As the dust of the towers settled and the sun set on America's darkest day, a two-decade conversation began that would define downtown Manhattan forever. There were a hodgepodge of ideas about what to do. Some wanted a memorial. Others, 46% in fact, wanted to rebuild them exactly as they were. A certain future president was this plan's loudest champion. That's where our loved one's spirits are. and We will never look away from it until we have a proper, respectful memorial and the dead are respected for what they did for this country. Everything is money. Everything is money, money, money. We need to rebuild. We need to make money. One, two, three. Money doesn't one, bring two, back three. lives. Money doesn't bring back mothers one, and fathers two, and sisters three. and brothers and daughters That's and sons. One, two, money doesn't bring that back. It became obvious to me the importance was to build it back as quickly as you possibly could, because without it, Lower Manhattan would stagnate. It would, ne it would never be the same. This place, this should not be a grave site. Everyone who lost their life down there does not expect the rest of us to be dragged down with them. This can be and should be a place of healing and rebirth. In November 2001, then Governor George Pataki and New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani formed the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation, the group that would oversee the redevelopment of Ground Zero. The group held a competition to design the new space. Proposals flooded in from around the world. Some designs were more of a memorial. One would recreate the towers in almost skeleton-like structures. But it was the design of Polish-American architect Daniel Liebeskin, which carved out room for both a memorial and a new landmark tower that eventually won. For a second, maybe, uh, I thought, God, what did I get myself into? But but it, did, it wasn't more than a second that I thought, however difficult this process is, however fraught it is with emotions, uh, why shouldn't it be? There's so much at stake here. I will stick by it. When I struggled with the master plan, I thought, what does this really mean? How do you combine in one project the homage to the heroes of 9-11, those who fell, who sacrificed their lives on behalf of all of us, and at the same time reassert the foundations for a resurgent Manhattan, for a resurgence of the democratic world and of democracy in the world itself. It set out half of the site, eight acres, as a place of remembrance. That was probably the most important function at the time, was to remember and acknowledge what happened on 9-11 and commemorate the lives that were lost. A feature of the master plan was the complex itself, a city within a city. The design would reconnect Lower Manhattan to Tribeca and the rest of Manhattan. He added in 10 million square feet of office space, replacing the office buildings that were destroyed on 9-11. But not in two towers, like were there before 9-11, but in a spiral of five towers, starting with what he called the Freedom Tower and its symbolic height of 1,776 feet, and spiraling all the way down to five World Trade Center. And these five buildings enveloped and protected that memorial uh, area. Liebeskin's design would provide the framework for the 20 plus year evolution of the site, but he would not get to design the tower. His original design called for 64 floors of office space and the rest of the tower to be a garden in the sky. 
Liebeskind's plan was praised by city and state officials, including Governor Pataki, who imposed an aggressive timeline to break ground. But Silverstein wanted to hire someone else to design the tower. Silverstein brought in David Childs of Skidmore Owings in Merrill to redesign the building alongside Liebeskind. Childs was actually one of several builders brought in to develop the vision for the site as a whole. He had already designed the Seven World Trade Center, which would be the first building to go up. Larry Silverstein hired his own architects to design each of these buildings. He hired three Pritzker Prize winners, which is like the Nobel Prize of Architecture. He insisted that these architects move from London and from Tokyo and from New York into a design studio that he built for them. So for a year and a half, these three architects, they worked together. They each had their own building, but there was so much shared infrastructure below grade that it was critical for Larry that they work together. The tower took many shapes. Childs and Liebeskind would collaborate on one of the designs that was revealed to the public in 2003, but the location and some of the design features faced criticism from the New York Police Department. Get a call one day from the police commissioner, and he said, Larry, this building can't be built. I said, and why? He said, well, that tower is offset. Second of all, it's in a bad spot from the standpoint of, of future terrorists, God forbid. Their concerns centered on where the tower stood, particularly its distance from the heavy traffic on West Street. He sent a letter out widely to everybody in Critch. Once that happened, I called the governor. I said, this building can never be built. It's now public knowledge. It is, it's not gonna happen. I said, David, please, we need to design a completely new building. So David Charles went ahead and produced the design that you see. It's a beautiful building. In June 2005, the final designs were unveiled to the world. Though the spirit of the master plan remained intact, the design of One World Trade was something entirely different. Gone were the gardens and the asymmetrical spire. Liebeskind went on to sue Silverstein for unpaid fees, but he eventually focused more on the site as a whole and his role in developing the master plan. New York City, the site has the final say. The final say is the meaning of that site. It's not uh, anyone's ego, it's not the architect, it's not Larry Silverstein, it's not the... It's the site itself, and the site requires a very sensitive treatment. It requires that we remember the memory of that, of that day, and it requires that we lay foundations for something really future-oriented and, and interesting for, for New York of the of 21st century. Kenneth Lewis was one of the architects on the project. When we began the project, we did talk about an iconic building almost from the very beginning, one that was soaring, and also one that was, so to speak, the marker in the sky for the World Trade Center and the events of 9-11. We began to think about how this project could be so much more than just another building being rebuilt on the site. Constructing One World Trade was an undertaking fraught with challenges that would consume its builders for nearly a decade. We were building a building over train tracks that were active. We had multiple governors and multiple executive directors of the Port Authority. Things were always changing, but the constant was Larry Silverstein and his team, the SOM and the construction team, and all of the consultant team who could put that noise aside and keep going forward. Building over a train, I do not recommend. We were dealing with safety issues none of which us as architects had ever dealt with before, and yet it doesn't look like a fortress. Key to the design is the massive concrete core. The concrete that we use is super high strength concrete. We created the safety core of the building, a protected area where the key elements of the building, including the water pipes that were coming up, would be inside this cage of, of rebar, super strong steel, so that no matter where the threat came from, those pieces would be protected and people could get out of the building. The twice as strong, twice as much rebar. And so should, you know, should some other thing happen, the building would be resilient, it would be able to be recovered, it would be stronger. We began to meet almost right away with the uh, battalion commanders and the fire responders, the chiefs. And the one thing they shared with us was a picture of a fireman coming up the steps 
while people were escaping. So what we did was we widened the stairs. We provided lighting in terms of a sort of airport lighting. We ended up with photoluminescent striping on the stairs, which is now the standard. Learning from that at One World Trade Center, our staircases are encased in two and a half feet of steel reinforced concrete. These staircases, as you can see, are, are very wide. They allow two lanes of traffic with uh, the occupants uh, exiting the building and then firefighters in full bunker gear can go up without disrupting each other. Also, the platforms are extra large. So if someone is hurt or disabled and they need to sort of move out of the way, there's space. So this model offers a pretty good visual of what the new World Trade Center looks like. The heart and soul of this project is the Eight Acre Memorial Park with the footprints of the Twin Towers and the museum. Around that are four office buildings, the tallest being one World Trade Center with its symbolic height of 1,776 feet. Next to it is an earlier model of two World Trade Center, another very large office building. And then there's three World Trade Center designed by Richard Rogers. Next to that is four World Trade Center. And then between one and two World Trade Center, you can see the Performing Arts Center. These buildings are all to scale, but of course, they're skyscrapers. They are really tall. But it gives you a sense of how Liebeskind envisioned these buildings would lay out per his master plan. You can see each building descends in height. They envelope and protect that memorial park. But they also fit into the skyline of Lower Manhattan. One World Trade, or as it was known at the time, the Freedom Tower, began to take shape, rising a symbolic 1,776 feet into the sky. It became the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere. The building process of One World Trade was fraught with delays and false starts. Quite literally, in fact, a purely symbolic cornerstone was laid down in 2004, only to be later removed. Construction finally began in 2006, but only after Silverstein gave up the rights to construct the building. His role was reduced, but he held on to the rights to develop and build towers 2, 3, 4, and 5. What we finally did was agree to, to give the port responsibility for Tower 1. We gave them the plans. For the next seven years, the tower rose floor by floor into the sky. On May 2nd, 2013, construction workers looked on as the spire was hoisted up top the tower. On November 3rd, 2014, more than a decade after the attacks, the building opened and Lower Manhattan was transformed again. I don't think we ever fully appreciated how long um, the challenge would last and how thoughts of 9-11 would linger, that they would feel concerned about even coming into the neighborhood. In the immediate aftermath of 9-11, many declared that no one would want to work in a skyscraper again. But as with most things, time heals. Media giant Condé Nast became the building's anchor tenant, renting 21 floors of One World Trade. I can tell you that the kind of pride I see people experience in being in the building is because they recognize that they've, they've made an act of faith about the country's ability to heal itself. As I stand here facing east-west, the shape of the building is approximately 200 feet wide, and the faces of the building are going up here, and that is the same figure of the old World Trade Center. Many pieces of the design of the building are what we call memory elements. The height of the building at 1,368 feet here, and then 1,362 feet here sort of represents the two buildings of the past. We began to talk about luminosity and light and the very special light that is in Lower Manhattan as we are basically out in the harbor of New York. We were trying to maximize daylight into the space. We always felt that that was something that gave people a sense of wellness 
it's a kind of, you feel refreshed when you walk in here and you see this daylight all day long. The space you see here is completely column free. There's not a column in the space other than at the perimeter allowing maximum flexibility. Downtown Manhattan has transformed in the 20 years since 9-11, from a place where people mostly worked to a place where more now reside. The population has more than doubled to 78,390 in 20 years. But the work is far from done. Five World Trade Center, a residential building, has not broken ground. And two World Trade Center has been designed and redesigned and redesigned again. When finished, it will be the second largest building on the site. Two World Trade Center is a building that we need to finance and find an anchor tenant in order to build it. It'll be the last office building at the site. It's a big building. It'll probably be the most energy efficient building in the country and a, and a truly spectacular building when it's finished. Debuting sooner is a performing arts center, which is set to open in 2023. There was always the intention that arts and culture be part of this campus. There are three different performing spaces, and they're all separated by these very large acoustic guillotine doors. So these doors go up and down. So depending on these doors being up or down, it changes the size of the room. The context of being part of the campus of the World Trade Center is always present. And I think that whether you think about it intellectually or not, I think subconsciously, the fact that you're experiencing works of art within that context of the larger campus is really meaningful. And I think it'll really affect the way you watch things and listen to things in this building. The translucent marble glows from within so that the entire building is a beacon of hope. And that is the most important aspect of the design of this building, is that it lights from within and it celebrates life, community, affirmation on this site. 20 years on, the memory of what happened lingers. But New York has done what it always has. It rebuilt. It's a whole group of naysayers out there. Well, I'll never come back. Never this, never that, never, 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 never. I've been hearing never, never for 20 years, sorry. <laughs> And so every time, oh, he'll never, never, he'll never, 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 never. I say, bullshit. <laughs> Ridiculous. New York is a city that will never be done building. Skyscrapers are going up bigger and faster. But none have been built taller than the One World Trade. I'm waiting for the day. I'm, I have a feeling that someone will try and do it as a kind of point of pride. As a New Yorker, it's funny how my head changes. If I walk through the memorial, I become more introspective. I think right for now, it is the sacred space in the city. It's only seven years since it's opened the memorial. I think that'll change over time. I do think it's unbounded energy that's going on inside the buildings and creativity. And people who work here feel that they are very different than the other office buildings that they've been in. I look up like anybody, like any New Yorker, and I'm kind of, oh, I worked on that. It's pretty cool.